Okay, welcome everybody uh, to PDX Shelter Forum number four. My name is Tim McCormick. I'm the co-organizer of PDX Shelter Forum and of this event. It's Monday, March 1st, 2021. And we are here live in Portland. And let's see. The title of today's forum is Alternative Shelter and Housing Requests for Public Involvement. The uh, context for this, of course, is first of all, the widespread and worsening homelessness situation in Portland and also up and down the West Coast, particularly, and to some extent nationwide. And PDX Shelter Forum started last year with a, a kind of guiding question, something like, how can Portland quickly provide safe private shelter or housing to all unsheltered residents? Unsheltered specifically meaning the neediest, like not even in a shelter. So today again, we ask that question to our panelists and to all of us and to the community in general, but we also ask it specifically in reference to a call for proposals that has actually gone out from the city of Portland and the county of Multnomah uh, to invite proposals for alternative shelter. Uh, and that is due on March 9th. So they've sort of come around in a way and asked publicly the same question we were asking in a way. The term that they're using um, is RFPQ, which is a sort of a jargon term, means request for programmatic qualifications. And we wanna support that proposal and people and teams entering, but also open it up and bring in wide community input and discussion and collaboration including ideas that might not necessarily be just for this RFPQ or just for right now or for city funding or only for Portland. So we called this as a bit of a nerdy policy pun, we called this an RFPI, this event an RFPI request for public involvement. And the idea is whenever government is trying to do something, they might put out an RFPI request for public involvement to openly invite and compare ideas and maybe the people might have some ideas. Or if they don't do that, perhaps we, the citizens or this group, might run an RFP for them to help them with that. Anyway, that's the, back, the thinking. So we are honored to have with us today some amazing guests. I think we've got three out of four of our confirmed people on right now. Uh, first of all, we have Dr. Sharon Myron, who is Multnomah County Commissioner for District 1, which happens to be my district. And we have General Jeff from Los Angeles Skid Row Neighborhood Council Formation Committee. And we have Mark Lakeman, founder of City Repair Project and lead designer at Communitecture. Uh, we also have confirmed Victory LaFara, uh, not yet on, and I'm not entirely sure if she can join, but she was the coordinator for C3PO camps in the city and also the, the program specialist for Dignity Village. And I'm going to let uh, our guests introduce themselves uh, uh, in just a minute, uh, starting with uh, uh, Commissioner Myron. Uh, oh, I just saw a message come in from Victory. She says uh, she says she is deadly sick today oh. and not able to. Well, she didn't say deadly. I'm, okay. I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm editorializing a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> It just flashed by my screen. <laughs> yeah, I shouldn't throw out, yeah, that, that's, uh, anyway, she says uh, she's not gonna be able to join the speech, but I think she's gonna be, gonna be watching. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, not she, I mean they, Victory. Thanks. They use they pronouns. Uh, thank you someone for pointing that out. A couple of housekeeping items uh, real quick. Uh, this event is live and being shown publicly. It's like being live streamed on YouTube. So everyone should that. Um, and keep that in mind if, if you speak uh, or identify yourself. Uh, there is a text chat channel on Zoom, which is used throughout the event. And I encourage everyone to open that up and look at that now and then, uh, because there are, there are often clarifications or side chat. I'm going to do the land acknowledgement right now. Uh, right, right. Okay. And we'll pass it over to Commissioner Myron. Okay, right. Go ahead, John. Thank you for being here today. Today, as we come together virtually for reflection, learning and action, let's take a moment to acknowledge and honor 
the land that we are on and its history. Our virtual forum is being centered on the traditional lands of the Multnomah, Waskow, Cowlitz, Kalamath, Clackamas, Bands of the Chinook, Tualatin, Kalapuya, Malala, and many other tribes that made homes in this area. We pay respects and thanks to the indigenous people for being the original stewards and protectors of these lands since time immemorial. And we acknowledge their enduring perseverance and resilience across generations. This calls us to learn how to be better stewards of the land we inhabit and our community and future. And with that, I'd like to pass it over to Commissioner Myron, who's gonna, who's gonna kick us off. Thank you. Um, so by kicking us off, am I, am I introducing myself or am I kind of launching into a bit yeah, of- Yes, let's introduce, introduce yourself and then launch into um, how you want to respond to the kind of the question that we posed. And then we can um, go on to the other panelists and, and start a dialogue. Great, great. So um, yeah, my name is Sharon Myron. I use she, her pronouns and I am the Multnomah County Commissioner for District 1. That is all of Multnomah County west of the Willamette River um, and then also the inner east side. So south of I-84 and then out to Cesar Chavez which corresponds to Southeast 39th uh, Ave. Um, I am also uh, an emergency room doctor and, and, uh, and also a mom, a couple of teenagers. <laughs> and I really appreciate being here today. I really appreciate Portland Shelter Forum for continuing to create these spaces for connection and discussion. And I really love the RFPI. You know, we have so many acronyms, but the request for public you know, involvement. Like you have to even like. Hello. Sorry. Uh, the old, the old Zoom meeting. Gotta love it. Um, but anyway, I love the RFPI, and I feel like that that should be um, key to all of what we do when we're we're putting out proposals for things, um, at least from government. And you know, the question: How can Portland quickly provide? And as a Multnomah County commissioner, I'm going to expand that to Multnomah County. Uh, quickly provide safe private shelter housing to all unsheltered residents. And, um, you know, I think, uh, Tim, you had alluded to uh, the fact that the Joint Office of Homeless Services has put out their RFPQ um, request for programmatic qualifications uh, for um, people, for community to submit ideas uh, to the Joint Office for you know, alternatives for just concepts for shelter, for hygiene, for housing. And this is the first time that the joint office has actually done something like this, which I really appreciate. Um, and <laughs> I also feel that we have so much more to do in this space. And so I personally um, do not intend for this RFPQ to be a checking the box and moving on kind of thing. Like, oh, we've dealt with that issue. We put this out there. So, you know, let's do something differently. Um, so in terms of the core question and how I think about it, I really see our situation right now as a humanitarian crisis, um, you know, we think about it, I, I don't think I'm alone. We see thousands of people living outside in unsafe, unhealthy conditions, both for themselves and the community at large um, with inadequate shelter and without access to medical care. So we, we have been seeing this for a while, the situation we all know has been expanding, but the COVID pandemic in particular has made our shared situation as it stands now just unacceptable. Um, from a health, safety, and just, I feel, human decency standpoint. Um, it's clear that urgent solutions are needed. And as an ER doctor, I have to say, I do have a special place in my heart for dealing with the urgent. Um, we need to do it all, um, but we can't be focusing on 
the future or, uh, you know, the better world we are going to be li living in, which we will, <laughs> I hope, um, but at the expense of ignoring the present. Uh, and so I want to acknowledge up front something that I feel is often missing from the conversations, but is central to the questions we ask and therefore the solutions we devise around houselessness. So there is a fundamental situation that our region right now does not have the capacity to provide housing or indoor shelter for everyone living on our streets right now. And that, that is a horrific situation. It is our reality. Um, and so though we know that housing is the thing that truly does end people's houselessness, um, and with the supportive housing services measure, we have a historical opportunity to provide more supportive and other affordable housing. Um, we can't just be working on that now without acknowledging the humanitarian crisis of the present. And in that regard, I personally feel that we are failing. Situation. And because so many people are experiencing no. tremendous harm. You know, as a, as, a, as a physician, a public health advocate, community health advocate, I really think about these types of issues more in terms of harm reduction. And I think that's something we don't talk enough about in the community forum. And that's, that's really a public health concept. And it, it, it means you take a, this not great situation that may be causing harm but how do you minimize that harm as much as possible while you're working toward longer term solutions? And that is a question I feel is answerable and actionable quickly. So, you know, the types of things, I mean, we can, we can get back to this and have the, you know, more of a discussion around it, but I feel one of the things that we could and should be doing is implementing a coordinated network of small, publicly owned sites where people who are living unsheltered and have to be because we do not have the capacity could have access to say insulated structured tents, um, bring their belongings, get assistance in getting to the sites and be assured that they would not be forced to leave or swept, um, that they would be accessible to transportation and services, reasonably distanced from residences and businesses there would be hygiene and sanitation services there along with access to mobile showers and laundry. Um, and then there's, you know, that's just one idea that we could have scattered throughout community that are small where people could live with dignity and be safe and have access to the things that they need to be healthy and safe. Um, you know, there's a whole array of models and approaches, you know, there's larger self-governed villages um, publicly managed villages and camps, scattered hygiene hubs, parking lots where people can stay in their IVs and have services. You know, there's a whole range of places where you can have a network of safe, safer, healthier, um, more stable options for people experiencing unsheltered homelessness in the near term while working for those longer term solutions. You know, from my perspective, these kinds of approaches just haven't traditionally been prioritized in the work at what our sort of larger coalition is at kind of that, that government coalition with um, sup supposedly public and private entities getting together to have the conversation of homelessness and those longer term solutions. We need to prioritize um, with a more expansive view and approach to the work we do in the community. So, um, I don't know if I've spoken long enough, too long, yeah. et cetera, but um, that's, that's great, Commissioner. That's, that's yeah, right. where I'm coming from. Appreciate it. Very thoughtful. Um, I think I think with that, we're going to pass it over to General Jeff. If you're able to introduce yourself itself, and maybe share a few thoughts about um, the question that we're proposing about how to support the unsheltered. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Hi, folks. My name is General Jeff. Um, um, I, I have to, I'm a proud Skid Row resident, um, a Skid Row community activist. 
um, as introduced. I'm chair of the Scarrow Neighborhood Council Formation Committee, and I'll get into that a little bit later, um, and many other titles, but I'm a Skid Row community leader. Um, I'm honored to be here. Great to connect with our allies in uh, the great state of Oregon, you know, specifically Portland, Oregon. And so, um, I, I, full disclosure, um, I don't work for the city of Los Angeles. Um, I'm, I don't have funding to build a, a homeless housing. And so, um, but I'm very outspoken in terms of the systems that are in place, uh, the so-called solutions that are on the table. And um, I'm very honored to be a part of this conversation, but I'm not, um, um, I'm not here for uh, the traditional uh, reasons I would like to think. And so um, I'll begin with this. Um, born and raised in, in South Central Los Angeles, um, I care greatly about my city of Los Angeles. Um, and, you know, Skid Row has is, is been in existence for over 100 years, and there are no solutions that are, are actually working. And so um, I did a little research online. Um, I woke up at four o'clock this morning. I was just so excited to be a part of this. And so I saw where um, it said a few years ago um, in the spring water corridor, there were like 200 tents and 500 homeless folks. And folks were claiming to be, you know, the, 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 the lar largest homeless encampment in the nation. It's laughable compared to Skid Row in downtown Los Angeles. We would love to have those numbers. That is such a small number. And so for us in Los Angeles, um, in the city of Los Angeles, um, uh, every year they do uh, what's called a homeless count. Um, the latest, and they didn't do one this year. Uh, well, they haven't done one in 2021 yet, but um, in 2021, they didn't do one because of COVID. Um, but the latest numbers are that in the city of Los Angeles, there's over 40,000 homeless people throughout the city of Los Angeles in Los Angeles County, um, which is 88 cities. Um, in Los Angeles, the city of Los Angeles is one, but in Los Angeles County, there's over 60,000 uh, folks, uh, homeless folks. And so um, to hear a number like as so small as 500, <laughs> oh, we, we'd be drooling to just, <laughs> we could just trade. And so, um, and I say that not on just behalf of myself as far as, as the community activists, but more, more importantly, the politicians. Um, and unfortunately, none of the, um, uh, none of their solutions um, are working. And I think that um, one of the reasons why I'm honored to be on with the folks, the great folks in Portland, is that um, while I'm hearing what the commissioner just spoke to and said that, um, you know, it's, it's, it's basically at a, at a point where there aren't enough solutions to handle the numbers where they are now. And uh, someone who's here on the front line of Skid Row, um, the real homeless uh, capital of the nation, um, I advise you all to handle it now before it explodes um, and get and goes out of control to an astronomical number where ours is, where it's virtually impossible to fix right now. Um, and that's, you know, I hate to be the doom and gloom guy, but um, that's where our state of homelessness is here in L.A. It, it, the, the little solutions that they're putting on the table is not if you if we've got 60,000 and I'll just start this just simple math. If there's 60,000 homeless folks in L.A. County and let's say, uh, you know, to build homeless housing, one one building, let's say for with 100 units, um, there would take 600 shovels need to be in the ground to build 600 units. And it takes on average three to four years um, to build uh, a, an apartment complex uh, for low income housing folks. And so, you know, we're talking about 600 shovels in, in here in, in California. The real estate in Los Angeles is, you know, prime real estate. And so as luxury condos are, are going up all over the place and there's not a priority uh, for, for the extreme amount of uh, low income housing. And so, um, and, you know, there are other folks that are, that, that are well off that are concerned with property values being reduced. Um, and then we just don't have the land. So when folks talk about everything from tiny homes, uh, pallet homes, shipping containers, you know, you just go on and on and on. Um, we don't really have the land here um, because the, the powers that be are, are, are catering to the big time real estate developers. So it's unfortunate. So the outspoken folks like myself and other allies, us activists, we're speaking out against the system that's in place. Like currently, there's a lawsuit here uh, where some concerned citizens sued both the city of Los Angeles and the county of Los Angeles 
um, a year ago, and there's a, a temporary g settlement on the table to for the city to provide 6,700 beds. And you know, and to me, you know, while people are patting themselves on the back, like the city is saying, "Hey, it looks like they're going to be," uh, you know, they may meet their expectations. I don't understand a, a solution on the table of 6,700 when you've got over 60,000. You know, what about the other 55,000 folks? It, 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 it's ridiculous. And then here every year, there's a, on the homeless count, based on their numbers, there's the double digit uh, increase every year. So homelessness has exploded beyond what the city of Los Angeles can, can financially pay for. And so now with the new administration in the White House, there's FEMA money. Um, there's funding pots all over the place. You know, in, in 2016, here in the uh, the city of Los Angeles, they passed measure HHH, which is the taxpayers tax themselves. It said $1.2 billion to build uh, homeless housing. That money has been redirected towards shelters. And so that's now, now that's the problem because, you know, a lot of folks think shelter is the solution. Um, the majority of the homeless folks don't want to live in a shelter. They want housing. Currently in California, there's there's a, a program called Project Room Key, be, uh, be that and Project Home Key because that's the uh, empty uh, hotels and motels that are empty because of COVID. No one's traveling, and so the hotels are empty. So you know they 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 they're, they need the business. There's funding there, and uh, initially it was supposed to have been fifteen thousand hotel rooms for homeless folks, um, and the city of LA has fallen short, well short. They've only provided about 4,000, roughly around 4,000 rooms. So they're 11,000 short, even though they've got the funding. And so us activists have to speak out to hold them accountable. And it's frustrating because, you know, I, I don't want to be the bad guy, but, um, you know, it's just extremely difficult um, to sit back and just watch this, you know, this inept, such massive ineptness and gross negligence happen consistently. And so... Um, I want to close with this. When we talk about shelter, um, you know, there's a concept in this society that everyone is entitled to food, clothing and shelter. Um, but understand shelter in that context is housing a home. So food, clothing and a home. Everyone's entitled to food, clothing and a home. Unfortunately, the solutions, you know, just like here, this converse, very conversation is about quick fixes. You know, quick fixes. There's no you can't build a house in a day. We understandable. And so. Um, you know, we talk about shelters. Um, shelter is different, like when it comes to the, the federal regulations through the Department of Housing and Urban Development, the par parameters set by HUD. Catering to the big time real estate developers. So, it's oh, thank you. Um, and so um, the shelter is totally different from housing. We, us advocate, allies um, and activists, we're fighting for housing long-term housing because if you know project uh, room key the hotel rooms that was only a 90-day solution come to find out and so um, what happens after 90 days the people wind up going back to the streets that's that's a short-term solution but they're saying oh well it, maybe within that 90 days there would be another solution some more funding that they could possibly extend the hotel room project or something else would come up and so it, it's just poorly thought out but our whole thing is if all the money was was invested into long term solutions and then if it take because if it takes three to four years to go through the process of trying to create space and shelter space for uh, uh, homeless folks to just temporarily stay, um, you could have had long term housing, which is much more cost effective. Unfortunately, in California, um, the numbers have gone up per unit. The price points per unit as high as $700,000 per unit for low income housing. So that's not a viable option based on the construction cost and things of that are sort that are happening in California. Maybe it's different in the state of Oregon. I don't know. I can't speak to that as much as well as you all can, but I'm just trying to share some of the different uh, uh, parameters and some of the, the obstacles of what are going on here. And so uh, a lot of the homeless folks, there's some folks that want to just get off the street if there's a quick. So it need, there needs to be a menu, a myriad of all types of long term solutions, short term solutions, make it all happen. But I advise you all to make it happen now while your numbers are as low as 500 before it gets to 50,000, because at that point, it is like when the like a, a volcano. Once the lava leaves, there's, you can't pull the lava back when the volcano erupts. 
So in Los Angeles, the volcano has erupted. You can't pull the lava back. Portland, I advise you to get it, get that volcano under control before it blows. Thank you. Thank, thank you, General Jeff. Um, now we're gonna pass it over to Mark Lakeman, if you could please introduce yourself and then maybe spend a few minutes reflecting on the question that we posed. Thanks. Um, well, okay, so I'm, uh, as you said, I'm the founder of City Repair and also at Communitecture. I use he, her, him, him pronouns, and uh, lately I'm a father. Um, I've been working on, working on houseless solutions since 1999 with the advent of Dignity Village. And I guess my usefulness in this conversation is that I remain available to help and support but also that I have both a, a, a long view of the evolution of the movement beginning from that point going forward with lots of uh, hands-on experience, um, you know, looking at, at lots of different villages that we've been supporting locally. And then I've tr been traveling extensively since that time, helping other cities get going. And speaking of Los Angeles, I actually managed to give a presentation to the mayor's staff and folks from all these other different bureaus uh, in Los Angeles, right as they had just kind of swept one of the major village installations down there. Um, so it really came in to shame those guys. And I, you know, I, I, hope, I hope it contributed to a transformative effect, um, you know, in some kind of window of opportunity. Um, Let's see. Yeah, so I just want to say a little bit more about my experience. It's, it's basically to look at things systematically and then get 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 projects going support people who have initiatives wherever they stand up wherever there's heat wherever people want to you know undertake an initiative and and basically with houselessness that's always everywhere um, people are standing up and um, trying to meet their needs get you know survive to the next day um, take care of each other and uh, so I try to th see things system systematically systemically and um, to me, I've always seen this crisis as uh, really, as, as Sharon, you said earlier, that it's a, a moral issue for all. I, I absolutely agree with that. And, you know, if we could all break it down in according to everybody's different perspectives on what that really means. But to me, this houselessness is the apparent edge of a crisis that is engulfing us all. And we've all been feeling it politically over the last, you know, many years, um, more intense in the last few. Um, but, you know, it's a breakdown. It's a breakdown across the board, vertically and horizontally, um, all systems. And what's playing out now is, is, you know, that people are being kind of just treated as if they're disposable, but they were always treated merely as a human resource, you know, by the, the power structure of the society. And our cr critique has to be political. It has to be economic. And so many people have less and, and so few people have so much more. We have to understand that there's this gross sort of tipping away from a balance um, that's resulting in all of these aberrant, you know, symptoms that we're we're seeing and feeling everywhere. Um, we're in this together, and if we if we try to divorce ourselves from the destiny of other people around us, we're only fooling ourselves, you know, and in going into denial and making it worse for everyone, including ourselves. So I think I just want to say I think that first of all I'm super excited to see this RFPQ come forward. But I'm really fucking pissed off too. Like, how how long have I and other people have to, have had, how long have we had to fight for this to finally become logical enough for municipalities to ask for it and 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 then like basically you know beg for ideas? We've been fighting for more than twenty. I've personally been fighting for more than twenty years, and all of these other people. And I don't. I'm not interested in shaming. I just want to observe that probably since those were great ideas long ago why we had to fight for them politically and fund them out of our butts. Like the things that we're saying now, which seem to be outrageous new ideas are gonna be logical to us in the very short term. So can we just say yes now? The things that are right on the immediate horizon that don't seem to make enough sense are, are, are tremendously logical to the people who are most in touch with the issues and are feeling it most urgently. And for those who have the power to say yes, now is the time. And again, about that, I mean, sort of the lifeboat metaphor, we're all sinking and everybody needs to start saying yes to each other. Um, and, and I know nothing's gonna be perfect, um, but at the same time, 
we are in a grand experiment, you know, like, I, I mean, in the sense that we have to experiment with almost anything that's with almost any idea that comes forward for us to consider, um, because we don't know the way forward. So everything has to be tr tested and tried. Um, yeah, so I just want to say that's the case with Dignity Village. That's the case with R2D2. And then what do we end up finding? The police actually testified when, when both of those things came up to the city council and they said, my gosh, under a with this radius of four blocks around each of these projects, they're the safest places in the city with the lowest crime rates. You know, with, and, and then late, years later, they're ver it, it's verified that they have literally the highest rates of participation and, and the least calls for any kind of intervention for like eight years you know, running or something like that with, uh, with episodes, of course. Anyway, um, all of that is just verification for what people on the very on the very kind of fighting edge already knew, you know that that General Jeff was just talking about. Um, we already knew that these things would work. How can we close the gap and become allies faster, sooner, with more solidarity, so that we can start to get up and running? Okay, so I I, I want to sort of step away from from talking so much. I have so many things I'd like to say, but I think. We need a spectrum of, of engagement. We need quick action. We need, we, need, we need ways of getting people just into bunk beds. We need ways of, for every single woman to be able to close a door at night. And I know that none of it, like Jeff, I, I totally agree. None of it's satisfying. Everybody deserves the dignity of permanent housing and shelter. And then more than that, every American needs to be able to live in an interactive participatory village. And, and almost nobody is, because we're all living in isolation we all live in developments. There's not a single public square in any neighborhood across the land. It's a it's a great broken design artifice that is resulting, you know, in political corrosion and so much distress. And we're all in it. You know, any one of us could become homeless, and then we're in that category. But we are all in distress. So I think we need a spectrum of engagement. All hands on deck. Quick action solutions right now, built out of stuff out of the waste stream, like we did with dignity. And then more organized solutions like the county is calling for right now, which are a step up. And then of course we need to be, I, I mean, I, you know, we're talking about the, a lack of space and I see all these storefronts sitting empty and heated with lights on and bathrooms, like a complete, like, like I agree with you, Sharon, we don't have the infrastructure to just move people into appropriate code compliant spaces with the funding to support them, it's true. But we also have elected officials all over this region from the, the city to the state who could use their ability, like this is the most underutilized tool of all, to call for all hands on deck. We have an emergency. Everybody needs to find space for other human beings right now and then however we do it with whatever pittance we have now to like support people, get you know porta potties out into public spaces, Okay, so last thing I just want to say, I sat with Ted Wheeler and a whole bunch of people from different shelters and, and, and NGOs um, before he came into office like five years ago. And he wanted to hear from us all about what we thought should be done. And all that anybody wanted to talk about was DIY solutions. And I definitely said to him over and over again, you've got to activate ODOT land because if you don't, it's going to be taken. And that's what we're seeing. And I'm so pissed off to be right years and years ago. And I'm, I'm, I'm just one little particle in all these people that were right long ago. And now we're seeing the, the freeway spaces and the public right-of-way spaces just being taken over with people who need some modicum of support. Garbage is strewn everywhere. People are obviously in terrible crisis. And we could have organized an approach to this years ago. But people just say no, or they feel like they don't have the power, and they do. So I want to hear a call. I want to hear a loud voice from all of our elected officials, like, we're in a crisis. We need everyone to show up, do whatever you can, and then kind of lay out a guide, set of guidelines for how to engage. Because it's going to get so bad that we'll all wish that we had done that. Okay, I'm done. Thank you, Mark. The uh, Very appreciate the passionate comments. I was wondering before we move on if you could maybe give us your, um, there's some comments in the chat around permanent housing versus shelter. Um, and there's one comment that I'm wondering if you could just uh, respond to or reflect on. This is from Andy Miller who says, quote, 
we are increasing our local spending much more dramatically on short-term strategies, making it difficult to know where the money will come for long-term permanent solutions, unquote. Um, what, how do you see villages or these types of responses fitting into this kind of dynamic of permanent versus shelter versus um, not a good use of resources versus a good use of resources? Well, it depends on who you ask. I mean, if you asked, if you asked a woman perpetually houseless out in the streets, what, what she'd like to see happen, she might just scream. Um, and, and, and just like any solution would be fine for that night. Can I please just go somewhere where I can close the door and feel safe? Even if, even if it's not even insulated and it's not even heated, I just need to be secure. And I need, you know, sometimes women get attacked, sexually assaulted more than three times a night. So when I think, for me, that's always been my, my main frame of reference to every answer. Like, how do we address that violence um, that's, that's happening every night all around us? You know, I can barely, barely sleep knowing that that's, that's happening. Um, again, it's it not, no short-term solution is good enough. And actually a lot of long-term solutions aren't good enough either. Like to just house people as if they belong in an egg crate like the Bud Clark Commons, what a pretty building on the outside, you know, and I love some of the social spaces inside, but they're basically housed. Dignity Village does a better job of rebuilding lives by giving people a chance to have accountability and, and, and responsibility and to grow into leadership. So, you know, some of our quick action, you know, low cost, super quick action, but super low cost, like less than $4 a night for Dignity Village, for instance, gives people more in terms of community and accountability and responsibility and, and, and a social infrastructure that they can grow into to create lifelong friends. And I'm not trying to romanticize this. I just think that every long-term solution needs an architectural and social architectural infrastructure that is worthy of human beings. And that we can already start to grow that in the short-term solutions as well. So that's an answer for sure. And then I think, um, you know, what I'm always on, like I do both. I'm working on multifamily housing all the time that achieves affordability through a lot of different classical and unconventional strategies. That takes a lot of time. And in the meantime, people, some of them are dying in the streets. So we need absolutely you know, low cost, quick action solutions now to get people off the street and into safety. So I think it's really both and, and better than ever. Yeah, thanks Mark. I, yeah, I just wanted to uplift or mention that Mark has, I meant, I call him sometimes the godfather of the village movement in Portland. <laughs> there, there have been many godfathers and godmothers, but Mark is an important one of them. And all the way back to uh, at least as far as um, Dignity Village early days, which was interrelated with city repair project and also with street routes. So there is a deep history in Portland to this. And that's both frustrating in a way, as Mark is um, testifying, because so many good ideas and things have been articulated, but it's also hopeful because there's hardly anywhere else in the country for sure where there's such a rich ecology of people who could help and really build wonderful things. And I think one thing Mark brings to it is the idea that going beyond just thinking about like remedial measures and makeshift measures, but like a vision of the world that we would like to have that might be a transformation of the present world. It might even go far beyond our present housing. And that resonates with me because I think one way that we involve all of the community is by building into it aspiration and, and the idea that we're creating joy and wonder and a new world for all, not just sort of like saving the neediest or something <laughs> important as that is. So thanks, Mark. I'm, I'm uh, really inspired by your work. I wanted to, uh, pass back to uh, Commissioner Myron, who I believe we have just until about 11. And in this precious moment where we can get some insight from you, from you I'm wanting to ask, uh, I think what, to you from your, your vantage at the county level as a commissioner and kind of you know, at the table at the highest levels, uh, what do you think are the most useful ways that community people like us can can build initiatives and get 
shelter and villages done? You know, what, what are key levers that we should be on top of and, you know, meetings we should be attending to, et cetera. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, no, thank you. Um, that absolutely makes sense. And I, um, you know, I, I think there are uh, a few places, you know, one of, one of the, the issues that I do see is kind of a siloing and, and the, the, even the word silo has become overused. I hate using it, <laughs> but, um, but just sort of the, you know, all of these different places, all of these different meetings, all of these different groups um, having very similar conversations, just not in the same place. Um, I really appreciate this forum because actually this is bringing together just a, you know, a broader spectrum of community and some of the actual, um, you know, people with lived experience, um, some of the advocates and builders and it, people who have done this work, uh, which is really, really helpful. Um, but I, I feel like I'm a Lord of the Rings fan, I have to admit, um, but I have this, you know, there's, there needs to be like one plan to rule them. All. I, I don't know if that's a good analogy or not, but some, something that is, is coordinating all of this and bringing it together and then putting it out there. But um, the way I think, so right now, and it's in that summary document, I hope somehow made it to, to you. Um, there is a group called A Home for Everyone, which is supposedly this coalition of local elected officials, along with philanthropy, along with the faith community, along with people with lived experience and the business community and um, residents and advocates that um, with the idea to come together around devising solutions around these policy, housing and homeless issues. Uh, I think that, you know, it's, it's a, I think it's about five or six years old now and um, it's a great concept, but not everyone that needs to be there is there. And rather than sort of a hub and spoke or something model where like I as being regularly on a home for everyone can be out here and get the ideas from community at the meetings I attend and then bringing it back to this large group where we all talk about it, it's, it's separate. And, um, and I think that, is something that needs to change. And it doesn't include organizations such as behavioral health, huge issue of, that's part of the spectrum of what's what's going on, what's part of the problem. They need to be at the table. Um, Hucker, the, I always get whatever there, urban camping in Portland um, that does the sweeps. You know, we need, sweeps are not the answer by, they're just inhumane and not the answer, but we need them at the table to have the conversation about what the alternative is. Um, public health, not at the table, but I think everyone can acknowledge the significant public health implications of all of what we're talking about. So we need that table to be broader. And then, but there is a way for you, everyone here to bring their voice to that table. There is um, the Home for Everyone Coalition has um, an executive committee meeting, I think it's once a month or once a quarter. I, I think it's once a month. Uh, and there's an opportunity for public testimony at all of those meetings. Um, and so come and testify and talk about those solutions and what you wanna see. Get a lot of people talking about the problems and the problems are myriad, but come and acknowledge and say, here's solutions, here's what we feel we need as community. Get a group together to go there and, um, and express this. Go to your county um, board meetings. Uh, there's an opportunity once a week for public testimony. And I think of all the people here, Mimi, I see you there, but people can come and speak for three minutes about whatever they you want to talk about. You can get together and present and say, Here's some ideas we want to see this. And, um, and so those are, you know, those are some places, right? It, and we listen, you know, we're five people who live in the community, same at the city. We want to hear, but we, we don't 
don't know what, if you're not the person like, like I'm on a home for everyone and this is my passion and I'm, I am in this every day. But if you have a different portfolio or whatever, you need to hear this regularly and see people. So that's an opportunity. Call people's offices, email them at, at the county, the city. And, um, you know, I think that those are some, some key opportunities and levers that, that really can make a difference. Um, you know, look at the RFPQ uh, acronym, whatever it is, uh, the RFPQ for ideas and community. I see a number of you here in Laquita, I'm looking at you uh, who could um, really use that to raise up the wonderful ideas that you have, that you've demonstrated and get them done. So that's an option as well. Uh, and so those are some places doing what you're doing now is phenomenal. Mm -hmm. Type it, do the report on it and get it to all the county commission members, um, the four elected ele officials on a home for everyone. And uh, I think that those, those are some key things uh, that can be done. Um, I also, you know, this, this actually has raised a question I'd really like to pose back to this group because I think about this tension a lot. Um, and I think it's related to some of what we all wanna see happening in our community, but it's, it's sort of what the right balance is for government and how government functions in this, um, particularly in regard to alternative approaches to camping, housing, shelter, hygiene, et cetera. Um, when government owns a program, it by definition becomes a, you know, so much more complex, so much more expensive and so much less involving of community. Um, but when, unless we support people in bringing forward uh, their ideas and bringing people together to, you know, make some of this stuff happen, make some of the, like the things like Mark's talking about, what a lot of you here are working on to get the support and facilitate then there just isn't, none of this stuff can happen. So what is the right tension? How can we be most useful in this conversation as we're, and in this work to advance what works for all of us in community? And like, I, I just wanna reemphasize the, in a harm reduction approach, as we're working toward the long-term solutions, um, making, places people live, um, enable them to live at least with the baseline of health, safety, and dignity while we're working toward the long-term solutions. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. We know you have to, have to go <clears throat> soon. Sorry, that was long. Oh, no, no worries. But, um, you know, thank, we're recording this and, you know, as the conversation goes forward, you'll be able to, to watch it at a later. Thank you, Commissioner Myron. That, that's very, I'm always wondering, you know, where are the levers? And um, we're gonna go to discussion in a little minute, but just to comment on that. I think one thing that many of us feel is there's this kind of blizzard of things happening. There's like articles and meetings and it, it's like really hard to keep track of it. I mean, I can say that I'm like very devoted to this and it's still totally, it's like herding cats. And so one thing that, one question I like to ask or keep in mind to people is to say, like, if you could direct a half hour or a one hour of this week in the best possible manner, what would it be? You know, because if we don't guide it, it's going to go down to like the Twitter drain or something. If we stop and think about it. We might say, OK, I heard that there was this one meeting about that issue. Maybe we should get together and like write a letter or show up at that meeting. And the thing is that th that thing is probably a hundred times more worth doing than others if you stop and think about the impact. And we and so one thing that we try to do or are trying to do with PDX Shelter Forum is basically support people in that. So for example, we're building a calendar that every time we hear about the hearing for any bill, then we put it on the calendar. So now you can subscribe to this calendar and like at the start of the week, you could open it up and be like, oh, city council Wednesday is hearing that. And it's all about 
taking that bit of time that people have and like spring it to the point uh, where, where it can ha have impact because most activity doesn't really have much impact. So, but thank you so much for that, for those insights, Commissioner Martin. Yeah. Jeff, I had a, uh, wanted to pass a question to Jeff perhaps, and then maybe go to Mimi after that. What I was interested in especially, and, and kind of why I thought to invite you is um, what so impressed me about what you've done is you're so much about self-determination and like in this neighborhood, which you're down, downtrodden and looked down upon, actually have an identity and have a community and can and say, you know, we live here, it's our place. And so I really admire that and see it as a model. And so my question to you is like, what roles can or should uh, houseless and unsheltered people play in you know, becoming part of even leading the process. Now, how can they get to the table and how can they lead things uh, with you know, the, the sort of insight and genuine knowledge that comes from, from being in the midst of it? Does that make sense? Absolutely, that's a great question. And so, um, you know, I commonly speak about our community as we the people of Skid Row. And one thing, I first moved to Skid Row um, in August, 2006 and in 2007, um, there was a there was a handful of uh, Skid Row residents. Shout out to Don Garza, who's also on this very phone call. Don Garza is an uh, uh, activist in Skid Row before I got there and helped guide me and show me uh, 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 the ropes. And so uh, thank you, Don, for uh, tuning in. Um, and so there were already a handful of, of Skid Row residents that were just tired of waiting. You know, where our, our, our fellow neighbors are dying on the sidewalks. We're dying in the missions. Um, you know, the help is slow to develop, and we just decided to do take a, a do for self attitude, and you know it stuck. And so a lot, all the funding at that time that came to Skiro is going to some form of housing, whether it's a, a permanent supportive housing or transitional shelters, things of that sort, or it was going to some form of recovery, like harm reduction is mentioned um, in this very conversation, twelve steps, NACA. Um, AA, self-help and things of that sort. There was nothing for permanent, no funding towards uh, positive programming. So in essence, there was absolutely nothing to do all day. You just stand around and wait. In the very month that I moved to Skid Row, uh, the Los Angeles Police Department, LAPD, launched uh, this, what they called the Safer Cities Initiative, was basically to criminalize houselessness and just basically started coming up with any co cockamamie reason to uh, put handcuffs on people and take them to jail because it was law enforcement's mindset that um, the Los Angeles County jail system is the largest, considered the largest mental health facility in the nation. Um, and so the whole thing was where they get them off the streets and get them incarcerated, then they can get the help that they need. And us activists are saying, why don't we need to, get, they, we need the help before we get incarcerated. And so we took a, 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 a proactive stance, create a lot of uh, our own programming, start our own basketball leagues, uh, the Skid Row 3 and 3 uh, Street Ball League, a chess club, a uh, Skid Row uh, chess club, a Skid Row photography club, two theater groups that write, produce, and perform on stage plays just to get people active and doing things positive. Because if you don't give people something positive to do, there's going to have some, they're going to fall into something negative and then the handcuffs are right there and that's what was happening just like with kids and after school programs that's the whole point to keep kids out of trouble same thing with homeless folks in the LAPD it was just this massive massive uh conspiracy it, it just got to the point where they were averaging about 30 at one point uh 30 000, um arrest tickets in one month and so they, it was just astronomical numbers as they called themselves quote unquote trying to clean the streets and so then we showed that we're not uh, uh, we're not all, you know, drunks, bums, and addicts. Um, you know, we are, we, we live here. Skid Row has been in where it is in downtown Los Angeles, been a community for over a hundred years, 50 city blocks. And, um, you know, the whole thing is, is to prove ourselves as being actual residents, which the city does not officially, the city of Los Angeles does not officially recognize the city of Los Angeles. And so through our positive efforts, um, the, the, the momentum grew of the respect group, and then through our community meetings, we're just grassroots, you know, organizations, um, and some ran by myself, some ran by others in our community, and we started building our confidence, we started speaking out for ourselves, 
Um, you know, and then we realized that the nonprofit organizations are part of the problem in Skid Row. Um, the CEOs and executive directors, the EDs, they um, you know, average six-figure salaries as high as two and three hundred thousand dollars. And so in Skid Row, it's job security for them to let homelessness continue to happen. They're not trying to end, even though in their mission statements and, and, and what they say in their press conferences, they're really not trying to make a, a, a home, end homelessness. Um, they just, that's a feel good story. Um, they really want homelessness to continue. So now the council, what has happened in the city of Los Angeles, they've learned how to monetize homelessness. So now homeless people on the sidewalks are now a commodity and now there's homelessness across America now is actually a multi-billion dollar industry. And so now, just like when, uh, you know, you hear the, 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 the presidents talk about creating jobs, the, the federal government talking about creating jobs, what that means for us in Skid Row, that means creating more nonprofit jobs. So that way, where there's the case managers, the caretakers, the service providers, the nonprofit sector creates jobs and the jobs component becomes more important than actually housing homeless people. So the more homeless people are on the streets and it's out of control, the more money is generated to take care of them. And so now it's turned into this whole different, uh, this different monster and it's out of control. And so we, the people of Skid Row, we're showing up to City Hall. You know, we're speaking, uh, doing emails, we're speak, giving public comment. They cut public comment down from two minutes to one minute um, because we're very, you know, pissed off like Mark. And we, you know, we're cursing and we're fussing and, you know, pounding the podium saying, hey, we're, you know, where's the sense of urgency? And because we, we really, and then folks like myself, you know, we're just constantly in the media giving guest lectures, just like we appreciate this opportunity here. And what we say is um, there's no politician that ran on, on a, a, with a campaign platform as an expert on homelessness. So the, so the politicians really don't know. So why are we waiting on them to provide the solutions for us? We, we have the lived experiences and now we fought to have lived experience as qualified as equivalent to a degree or certification. Um, we have the lived experience. We know what we need to get, get ourselves out of homelessness. We, need to, we just don't have the resources. And so that's, what, that's where the change in the energy is now. The politicians don't have the answers. The nonprofits don't have the answers. So who has the answers? We, the people. And that's what we're doing to uh, stand up for ourselves. We created, uh, in, in the city of Los Angeles, there's a, not, uh, a neighborhood council system. Um, I'm the chair of the Skid Row Neighborhood Council Formation Committee. And it's the only system in America that, uh, that the voters voted on it in 1999 city charter. Um, neighborhood council. There are currently 99 neighborhood councils across the entire city of Los Angeles. And what they are, they're community advisory boards that can speak directly to the politicians in City Hall. And so we felt in, in, in Skid Row, we we're a part of the downtown Los Angeles neighborhood council. But that neighborhood council is focusing on the skyscrapers and all the bars and restaurants and all this wonderful tourism that comes to our community. And But they don't really focus on homelessness. And so we fought to have our own Skid Row Neighborhood Council. And we're still fighting that to this day. And so, but that's what we're doing. We have a proactive do for self attitude and we're not waiting for anybody because our neighbors, our, our friends, our families, we're dying, they're dying right next to us. Whether it's the winter storm, whether it's COVID, whether it's natural causes, where it's lack of nutrients, we can go on and on and on. But, you know, we, we're taking a proactive stance and we advise the folks in Portland do the same thing. There's a lot of wonderful folks on this very call right now. And I can see that folks are active. You got to get in the face of those uh, politicians on a local, on three levels of government, local, state, and federal. And so they're the politicians that represent those districts, whatever district the homeless folks are in that represent your town, your city, your community, get those folks involved. You know, their representatives have to invite them to be a part of the meetings, a part of these panels, get them to speak and hold them accountable. That's what we're doing. And we're not we're not fighting because they need the sense of urgency more so than ever now. Tim, may I? Um, yeah, I? go ahead. Thank Do you. Me. Um, boy, General Jeff, I would love someday to meet you in person. Um, I'm the wild child who has shut down city council here to bring houseless issues to the council specifically for the last five years. 
And oh, really? um, yeah, and it's been a drag because I, I've always felt that there's no other way to get or in the past until really right now, um, there, there's been no other way to get the mayor <laughs> and the council to talk about these things because they don't have to unless somebody shuts down the council to make these things talked about is the only way. And the only reason that houselessness has really started to be talked about in the last four years is because people were joining us in shutting down the city council for that very reason that you were talking about. And yeah, we, you know, my friends are uh, living on the street in my little village called St. John's in North Portland. And that's primarily who I work with. So one of the questions I have for everybody here is I, I, we use the words urgent. You know, this is an urgent matter. People are dying every fucking day on the streets here, anywhere, you know, in any part, LA, here, you know, uh, other parts of Portland. And we're supposed to, we're supposed to come with like, we're about to set up another guerrilla style village where we're just doing it in St. John's because we need it because the people who will be using what we're helping to create for them as structures, want those structures, the structures are sound. Are we also creating an R, F, A, B, C, D, E, F, G thing for, for whatever the, the acronym is? Yes, but if that, if, if that proposal doesn't go through, you know, whether it's because I'm on it, you know, and as somebody, and I'm not liked by so many people because I just work for the people rather than with politicians. If that proposal doesn't go through, I'm not not going to put this entire village up for people who want this. Um, it's not even a tenable thought to me to stop doing what we're doing for structures for people because some other people say, well, we don't get a cut of that financially because what we're creating is so inexpensive and so solid a structure that other people, none of us get paid. We just pay out to create these structures. Nobody gets a cut of it. And yet seeing how beautiful it's gonna be when we set it up, we're gonna need a trash company to come. Well, who do we have to service the people on the street? The only people we have, the only contract that we have is Rapid Response. It's a multi, multi-million dollar corrupt company that is um, uh, contracted from both the county and the city. It's the only company we have, the only contract we have to pick up people's trash. Metro was doing a really good job for a minute by giving us trash bags when we created our transitional village called Jason, Bar uh, J Jason Barnes Landing, named after a good friend of ours on the street who told me, I need you to create a village for us. You're the only person who can do this. You know what you're doing. Please get your friends and create it for us because I'm going to die on the street. And he died on the street. His name's Jason Barnes. We're recreating Jason Barnes. When we had Jason Barnes Landing up two years ago, Nick Fish of Parks came in with the Rangers every single day for nine months, harassing us, sweeping us, bringing the cops in, causing our um, village residents to go to the hospital and, and taking the toilets that were prepaid by a business person in this neighborhood for a year. He called all the toilet contracts and said, you know, whatever, honey pot, whatever they all are. And he called everyone and he said, if you bring toilets back to Jason Barnes Landing, we will kill your contract with the city. So my question is, knowing all of this, why would I even bother bringing a proposal in to Home Forward or Homes for Everyone, you know, a home for everyone, where it can be discussed as if there's no sense of urgency. I don't want things to be discussed anymore. I want us to pop up villages that the people want, not what I want, what the people want. And if we have the ability to do that, and we do, Mark knows how to do it. I know how to do it. I, there's five people I'm working with with mine who know how to do it. Folks from Village of Hope know how to do it. You know, we, we know how to do these things. 
if we know how to do these things and we know and we agree that there's an incredible sense of urgency and people are dying and we know those people who are dying, why would we go through this process other than to say, okay, fine, I'll play along because that's where I'm at right now. I'm like, all right, cool, I'll play along. But there's, mm -hmm. no, there's no actual urgency when people say, well, let's discuss this. That's not urgent. That's the opposite of urgent. That's saying we have a lot of time to hang out while people are dying on the streets when we have yeah. temporary solutions. Absolutely. Just, yeah, I was, I was just going to, I think the passion that you bring and others bring and um, the ingenuity and energy that uh, uh, folks I've met living outside bring um, needs to be harnessed and I feel like the community is stepping up and saying, we want to help be part of the solution and we want to partner with, or we want, we want government not to be the barrier. And I know that there's been, just like you, I know there's been other groups that right now and in the past have been working to create safe places, villages for folks to be um, on public land. And I feel like in order to respond to this as an emergency and to give people a better situation and a better opportunity in their lives, we need to collaborate. And I think that is what I'd argue is um, the, some energy should be put into um, working with folks like Commissioner Myron and the city to try to be allowed to take, uh, to use resources that we collectively collectively own um, and be allowed to, to give people a better uh, situation. But I totally hear you. And there's so many stories of people trying to help and not being able, being blocked by government or perpetual trauma um, uh, put onto folks um, trying to survive. And I think that we need to shift our approach to this issue. And that's part of the reason why we're bringing folks together in this forum and others to try to share these messages across, um, across our community. Thank you, Mimi. I appreciate that whole issue. This is something I think about all the time is like, how do we bring this to urgency? How do we convey it? How do we make it practical? Because I think that no matter how much you hear good words and good wishes, there's ultimately like, deep empathy gaps, because from, as I see it, I, I really just think that, you know, people who are securely housed and particularly who always have been, there's a limit, I think, to how much one can relate to someone who isn't. Like, it just hasn't been your existential experience of not knowing where you can sleep tomorrow or tonight. And that experience is so radical that it just, you know, it's not appreciated. And I always feel that um, when you have these conversations, you can, I feel like I can instantly tell who has had any experiences close to that. Beca and, and frankly, it's almost all people you encounter in an official leadership community. And just that my father has an expression, he says the bureaucratic gate, meaning the way people walk and their mannerisms when they're like secure government employees and they, they have no personal risk. <laughs> and uh, I'm reminded of that. And uh, so it just needs to be brought. The question is, how do you bring this home to people that you can't, you can't just kick it down? As, as you say, Mimi, that like, we, we don't want to discuss it anymore. There's bodies on the street. And I should say to the credit of our officials, not, not that I want to be their patsy, but I feel like there is, there has been a gradual reorienting of the shift ship. And so when we talk about like what can be done immediately, well, I think that if you put this to the head of the planning bureau or Eric Engstrom, he would say, well, we've developed this thing, shelter to housing that lets outdoor shelters be located by right. In their, from their point of view, that's like immediate, that's like today, I mean, <laughs> right? And so, I mean, it, it's not exactly guerrilla uh, occupation, but from their point of view, it's, it's radical that they're allowing like shelters of new form to be set up. And so the, the distance between the kind of urgency of direct action and like what the planning bureau is actually contemplating and making rules for is actually really narrow, I think. And I'm wanting to sort of narrow that gap further and be like, how do we operationalize this? 
how do we get like, how do we spin up outdoor shelters and villages and, and mobile units? And, and at the outset say, we need to be operating on the scale of need. We've got 2,000, 5,000 people, whatever on the street, whatever we're talking about needs to be something that gets to that number quickly. Like before the, before another person dies. That's how I look at it. So thank you, Mimi. I appreciate your, the energy and foregrounding of that urgency. We have some, I've been collecting questions in the, in the doc, by the way, and I'm trying to capture them off the registrations and chat window. Does anyone else want Andy, to jump in here? Well, Andy's had his hand up for a while. Andy, do you okay, want to okay. say a few things? Sure. Hi, guys. Um, Andy Olshin. Um, for a while, I served in the Mayor Willie Brown administration in San Francisco as a deputy city attorney and then as the homeless coordinator for the city. Since 97, I've been up here uh, working behind the scenes in all sorts of capacities around homeless youth and early childhood education, uh, inside government, nonprofits, private sector work, et cetera. Um, last three and a half years, I've been working starting at Hazelnut Grove, um, asking the folks who live in the different villages what they um, would like to do uh, with their space, uh, bringing volunteers, building materials, et cetera, down there. Uh, we built out a whole bunch of structures. I'm so thrilled that the political opposition to closing Hazelnut Grove um, has won out. I'm shocked and amazed uh, and thrilled that uh, both, it seems like, uh, Dan Ryan uh, and others uh, have made that happen. I think that the opportunity for adding capacity to our system, um, it, it's not about this alternative shelter RFP, frankly. It's about our community, our churches, our property. This is about land. It's about what's allowed where. I agree, Mimi, that it would be great to be able to pop these things up uh, wherever we can. And I have been accused of doing that on occasion. But I think um, that we do have all sorts of um, advocates, just the people on this line um, have, have worked tirelessly. Jordana, I probably pronounced that incorrectly, from, who is now with A Home for Everyone, is a perfect example of somebody that worked in the, in the streets and can um, you know, talk the talk, walk the walk, work with congregations to um, provide the space that folks like Mimi and Mark and other folks can say, hey, I've got these, this idea for a plan, I've got these volunteers, and uh, Cascadia Clusters, the organization I started about three and a half years ago, that's my dog, sorry, um, is um, working on the Capitol Highway site. We've been there for about a year and a half, and we are really uh, ready now to do a, a series of pop-up uh, villages uh, with platforms surrounded by rat proofing and insulated uh, tents. We've found a whole bunch of ice shelters. I just bought another eight of them the other day. So I think we actually have the capacity to pop up a village of 20 platforms, ice shelters, and a mobile shower laundry unit. We just need a, a place to do that. The idea that the community that is um, against these things, parts of the community that are against these things, can easily be mitigated by having a mobile solution that can sit for six months. If we can prove ourselves that for six months we can make something work, then I, I really think that that allows a breathing space. If we say to a church parking lot, hey, we need 10 to 12,000 square feet, we can put up a pop-up village with 20 units, have a, um, an on-site uh, shower laundry facility, we can even bring a 1500 gallon water container. We can do water filtration. I mean, Mark led the way around this stuff and it's out there. There's plenty of information. There's Todd Ferry's group. There's, there's a lot of energy to do this. What we need is the land and the best land to use our 
parking lots owned by faith-based institutions because the land use process is simple, quick, and easy. I'm going to shut up in a second, but before I do, I just want to also say that right now the government is looking at possible sites, eight sites is what I understand they're looking at, to have alternative shelter sites uh, placed on. These are publicly owned sites. Now, two of these sites, one is at 2700 Southwest NATO Parkway. The other one is clearly compl more complicated. It's called the Clinton Triangle. And that's on Powell and Milwaukee and Clinton, right near the fire station. My understanding right now is that that it's all public record that, that those two sites are the future sites for the, the two of the C3PO villages. Um, one is the QA village and the other is the BIPOC village. I do not understand why we cannot leave those villages where they are and add to the capacity of the system. Are, all of the folks that are involved in all this stuff are gonna be spending quite a bit of time moving villages instead of building new ones. And I, I would say until there's a shovel about to go into the ground for some kind of private sector development funded by Prosper Portland, those villages should stay there. And I, I don't know what to do about that. So Mimi, um, I don't know, should we have something happen here? I hear, I tell, I, I hear you. And I think part of, um, part of the why of it, part of the why keeps coming back to what General Jeff was talking about, which is the money. And it's what we talk about out here. Everybody on the street here knows that they're a commodity for very few people, like probably 10 people in the top three of those are the ones really making the mint, you know? And so doing this, you think about all of the money that goes into getting another contractor to do a dig somewhere else, just that, the developers, the everything, right? So what I think, if, if this is gonna do anything, this, this meeting and further future meetings and things like this, I think the push needs to go to people like Sharon and people like Tana Sanchez and um, um, Tina Kotek. These are people in my district, you know, who, um, who have to push people who are spineless, like the mayor, to do the right thing by what you're saying, leaving things where they are. We need more built. We don't need things moved to other areas. And the other part of it though is um, we need things that are built for the people also with the people. So I, I am in complete disagreement, not with you, but with the whole concept of places like um, Do Good Multnomah running something with their set of rules. I wouldn't want to go live in something with somebody else's set of rules in my house. This is for the people. This is shelter. Yeah, I think we need, honestly, I think we need, I think we have to acknowledge though that we need a continuum of these things. And we also have to acknowledge that there are, there are folks living on their streets with acute mental health issues, with acute uh, substance abuse issues that need some kind of support. And you know we could we could go back to to, to Ronald Reagan in the seventies and you know uh, taking apart the mental health institutions. I, I do think Do Good Multnomah has done some tremendous work all I'm around all that, sorts of things. All I'm saying is that we have to put the focus back into the community that we are working with and that we are working for. We meaning I, the person, not. A politician or somebody else, you know, or or a sure, nonprofit. Absolutely. That what do they? What do the people need? And what? How do they want their space run? Yeah, I gotta get out of here. Not too much. Mark's got his hand up. Let's give Mark, a, okay, Mark. a chance to respond. Thank you, Sean, for tracking the hands. I'm not seeing them, so I'm glad you are. Thank yeah. you. Um, well, a couple of thoughts. First. Um, I totally agree with, with tons of what you both just said. And I wanted to point out that about, um, I guess six or seven years ago, the folks at um, Bureau of Housing gave me a call and they're like, well, you know, there's always this complexity about extending Dignity's contract to be able to be there. And I'm always just blown away that they have to dig down and figure out new promises and new commitments. But I, I was actually asked, do you think that we um, could just go ahead and close this down? And I was like, geez, 
everything's getting worse and you're, you're even asking that question. I mean, I actually had to point out that things are worse and having more people on the, like, this would be bad politically as well, but I mean, it just fundamentally be bad for the entire kind of quagmire that we're in to close down a successful DIY model that is self-funded, frankly. Um, so I'm just wanting to raise that because some of what we're contending with is absurdity. And that's based on absolute, you know, abject disconnection. Um, that, you know, as we, as, as you, I think you were pointing out, Mimi, like not only is it already difficult, but the system works against the solutions that do emerge um, unnecessarily throwing up more and more hurdles. Okay, so that's all true. I'm really excited though, that the county actually has stepped forward to ask for ideas. And what I'm immediately seeing, I mean, and, and okay, it's not good enough. I, I, the, the, the question I wanna see is who anywhere has an idea that we can support? Not what sort of you know, NGO that wants to manage something, but okay, that's the edge we're on, all right? So I'm excited about, about the fact that there's anything to respond to. But I'm also noticing right away that there isn't a consortium, there isn't a model already developed, there aren't a bunch of people lining up, as far as I know, to step into this, um, and especially from the DIY community, like who is able to have the infrastructure to step forward and, and figure out how this is going to be self-managed and also identify the land at the same time and have partners that can start engaging that conversation while they start designing this thing, like we have the expertise to make this thing happen, this group of people in, in our networks, for sure. And I wish that the question was, you know, who anywhere needs needs support, because, you know, that would mean that people um, in the freeway right of way could submit something and say, we need porta potties, we need sinks, we need a, a mobile gray water system. Um, we need some, 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 some linkages to support services, you know, and just like, like, Mayor Hale said years ago, we need to go to where the heat, self-organizing heat is and support people. And I want to remind people back then when he was mayor with six, a budget of 600,000, you know, they went out and provided water and storage and toilet facilities and garbage service to all the self-organized villages that had a certain population of, of more than a certain minimum. And it was so profoundly effective and the overall program for the whole city that what wasn't even adequate ended up costing less than you know what it's costing to build one unit in los angeles so i mean there's all this low-hanging fruit and these things there are things even things that have been tried before that we know would be successful and there's all these people as mimi keeps saying and andy keeps saying like that are ready to go um but i i'm just like i'm just hoping people will step forward and engage the edge that the county has offered and let's create a model there while we continue to, to push on all the other on all the other edges that we already occupy. Thank you, Mark. That's a great, great point. Okay, we've got Jordania, you're up. Hey, this is Jordana. Um I um started with C3PO in April when um, we opened and I just stepped into a position at the joint office as the alternative shelter project manager. Um, I just wanted to speak to a few things. I think I come from a place of grassroots organizing and I've had um, my concerns about um, having to jump through all the hoops of working with local government um, and the deeper into this work I get, the more I understand that, like, it is the responsibility of the government to take care of the people. And if they have the funds to do it, um, it's the people who should say how those funds should be used. Um, I do think it takes, it does take a lot of organizing, um, to make a, I mostly work with alternative shelters to make an alternative shelter healthy and run. What people deserve is wraparound services and that comes with a lot of work. Um, and I also think that there is a place and C3PO is one of those places where we've seen a really amazing um, melding of a traditional shelter model with a democratic um, like villager based model um, like it very much is built off the Dignity Villages model. 
um, watching people step into the C3PO camps, get access to resources, and then also learn how to change their concept of culture um, and that they have the right to make community rules and community changes and decide how their community is run, but be supported through that process um, through a timeline of becoming like more and more self-sufficient, I think has been really beautiful. And watching the queer affinity, the BIPOC and Old Town villages, like each do it a little bit differently based on the people in their villages, it's been tremendous. Um, I'm really excited about the work that the Shelter to Housing Continuum is doing in terms of opening up zoning for more alternative shelters. And I also think one of the reasons that the QA and BIPOC camps are gonna move is so that they can have better facilities. Um, and I think that matters. I think it's great to, I absolutely understand the sense of urgency. Um, there are people dying. And at the same time, urgency can also lead to um, supports that aren't what they should be. Um, and we're kind of like balancing that, right? Like, yes, a porta potty is amazing for someone who doesn't have a porta potty. Um, and also, like, what else do people need? Um, and being like, I try to be mindful that urgency is also like a primary tenet of white supremacy culture and that we do sometimes have to slow down and talk about what what people really need and how to do it in the right way because C3PO was a process that was thrown together in literally a couple of weeks and it was rough from the beginning. You know, when you just when you just throw throw some porta potties and some pallets together, I mean, there's a lot to work out. Um, so I think we just have to find this balance and I really think that I'd like to see um, orgs who can step up and be able to take that government money and support unhoused folks in running their own village with the support of that funding. I think that's huge. Um, and it's it's been really amazing. And I'm happy to talk to anyone who wants to talk about those villages um, or anything of the sort. Thanks. Thank you, Jordana. Thank you. I'm really glad you joined us today and give us these insights. As with the commissioner, I think, um, we all come from different places and in some ways, you know, kind of everyone feels like they're not quite at the table. And so it's great to have, to actually be able to listen to people who are coming from different places. And, you know, one thing I recognize is that in a way we're out and just a community member, you have some cause. It's easy to be able to get a bit unilateral and just be like, have this demand, this is banner you're marching behind. But I always try to keep in mind for officials and staffers, they're in this complex matrix of requirements and demands, like lots of legal requirements, you know, things that the voters have demanded, things that officials are telling them. And it's kind of a much different uh, equation they're trying to solve, uh, right? It's, it's like you and the community as an advocate are like one party in a way, or, or intend to go down that track. And an official running a program or a staffer in charge of a, you know, initiative is, is solving for the many things that are coming from many directions. So I, I really appreciate that perspective. And I wanna say um, like, I want to, you know, extend a peace branch or, or a collaboration offer and say like, how can uh, the community help and, and be productive and direct its efforts well? And th this is a question to plant with you longer term, not answer on the, on the spot. But one thing I think is we have like a teeming ecology of people with talents and drives and wishes, and a lot of it doesn't know where to go. And, um, and I think it can polarize, it can frustrate, it can burn out easily. The other side of the fence are people trying to get programs to work who often need things, who need help. So, you know, we're trying to like uh, close these gaps and make these connections. And not to say we all end up, you know, kumbaya and agreeing on everything, but at least we can try to steer ourselves to, to constructively for all our, our sakes and for the goals. Uh, Sean, do we have any other hands General, or questions? General Jeff just floating? raised his hand, why don't we? Pass it to General Jeff. Okay. Okay. Hey, I just uh, wanted to uh, piggyback off of Tim's important comments. Um, and I just want to share this with this group. You guys got great, tremendous energy. I love everybody's uh, solutions and energy that everybody's bringing to the table. Um, wow, there, there's so much positive uh, success can actually uh, happen out of this. And so I just want to say, that, um, gee, I wish we had that kind of energy here in LA. It's so much, uh, uh, every it's, it's, uh, it's so much divisiveness. But what I want to point out is that, um, it's so important that we don't get caught up with, 
um, the powers that be who only allocate, you know, a minimal amount of funding and resources every year. And then we, the people have to fight over it and scramble and bicker back and forth where it's like, instead of when we come with our solutions and it, 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 what we can't do is allow ourselves to get caught up in instead of what we should be focusing on is in addition to. So what I'm hearing um, what Mark is saying as far as activating the uh, parking lots at the churches, you know, that's a viable solution that needs to happen. You know, what Mimi's saying about the villages and with the, 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 the spaces, the safe spaces where people that who don't need rules, that also needs to happen. And there needs to be a whole myriad of options and, and folks can gravitate towards where they need to go to. And so instead of it being this solution or that solution, pick one. It should be both. For instance, you know, if, if let's say the powers that be say we've only got, you say, a million dollars for one solution. What's the one solution? Well, we, the people of Portland, will say, hey, well, we want to do Mark's solution, Mimi's solution, and General Jeff's solution, and we want to put all of that together as one solution. And then, that, then it's on the powers that be to fund that instead of just saying us arguing amongst ourselves, which one of our solutions do we put forth? No, we've got to come together together and say, hey, well, maybe two of Mark's solutions and, and one of General Jeff's and three of Mimi's need to go and combine and that qualifies as the funding. Let's, you know, fund multiple solutions and put them forth as one solution and combine. And I think that we can get a lot further with a, a, a concept of in addition to instead of the concept of instead of. I just want to add that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're, we have about set, um, 15 minutes, by the way, left. And also, incidentally, we're going to uh, we're going to end the program and probably the recording at 12, but then stay on for like half an hour if anyone wishes to. In the same way that at a real world, at a physical world event, you can hang out afterwards. So that um, is an opportunity to chat, raise questions. I'm just looking. Any other a, a question from Sabra, Marcroft? How are different groups addressing the shrinking? of insurance availability for shelter solutions in the last year? I, this is something I'm not aware of, um, Sabra. Is there something that's changed in the, in the insurance situation for shelters? I'm not sure I know what this is about. Uh, Sabra, if you're there, feel free to unmute uh, or hop in the chat. In general, uh, what I'd like to encourage is to, in the remaining time, if we could talk about what concretely we might want to do next. In general, supporting each other, and also because it's imminent in regard to the RFPQ, which is due on March 9th. Uh, and I just wanted to comment on that. I think one theme that we've heard today is there's sort of like the tensions between people out there feeling a sense of emergency, and haste, and on the other hand, a sense that you know government works in a certain way, it may not respond to those needs or it might not be able to. And relating to that point, I think one thing that's going on is a, a, a community-wide interest has been responded to by the county with this RFPQ, which I think on the one hand is great because it's responding and it's doing something, but there's a little bit of a risk also that we get take all this community energy and funnel it into something where the rules are set by the government. So I, so I wanna, at the one, on the one hand, encourage like, get what we can out of, out of what they're offering, but don't be limiting to it, you know, because the truth is it's a very small window of opportunity with, very, with some strict guidelines and it, it's only a certain narrow avenue for uh, what's a much wider need. So I wanna encourage people to think about what can we do longer term? How can we encourage them to do another RFPQ in six months when we've had more time to think about it? What can we do that may not involve the government at all? You know, as Sharon Myron said, uh, as, as soon as the government gets involved, it tends to bring a lot of layers and complexity. So we, I think we should always be thinking, what, what would we be doing if government weren't involved at all? You know, maybe there are things we could do better. So, okay, any, uh, so any thoughts on that particularly or welcome, you know, what to do next or uh, Sean, what questions are you seeing? Oh, uh, Sabra, I think answered that question. She said Lane County 
and that's Eugene or Agunia, indicates that providers are encountering refusals to cover new projects. Yeah, in general, um, just context, it's one of these things that is like, when you talk about shelters, alternative doing anything, there's a couple questions that like immediately emerge in every conversation. One of them is like, where's the land or who's providing the land? And then that leads right into the next question. And it turns out that that's actually like lots of land. The city and county and most governments have lots of land. The reason they don't just let people camp on it, or one of them, is that they fear major liability. And so this is at least the, the, the reason they give. You know, so um, tackling that is actually pretty, pretty crucial. Uh, Sharon asks, has an inventory of church sites been taken? I'm not sure, and I'm glad you mentioned that because I think this is one of the, the foremost like practical things that should be done and we could do is working on mapping and listing of sites. And I think that frankly, I've the evidence I have from a bunch of sources is that the city and county have been kind of stonewalling, like, like not enthusiastic <laughs> to, to give out information. We hear that they have in the past gathered lists of public sites and we've tried and tried to get them to share that. And I don't know what to do. At some point we may need to go like a freedom of information act or something, but, or we could learn, we could, you know, observe the reluctance and try to understand why. And, but one way or another, it, it's knowledge, it's data, it's about maps and parcels and what their status is. So that means there's capability for us to assemble it. So I would really like as a concrete measure to set in motion, just kind of open community mapping, like find and suggest sources. And maybe you don't really need to like map the whole city because it's obvious what the hundred likeliest sites are. Maybe what you need is just sort of like a, a suggestions process where people point out and pin on a Google map, like the likely places. Cause you know, ultimately what we're, what we need to get to is 50, a hundred sites where you can move villages for six months at a time, at least. That's pretty concrete. We, we've got hundreds of thousands of lots. How do we, how do we find that 50? most efficiently. So that's my vote for like practical thing to do this week. So <laughs> anyone else want to jump in? I have a, a comment about something uh, Andy Miller said earlier, If, um, I, but let me uh, leave it open for others. Mimi. Uh, Cora Pata comments, the challenge that with publicly owned sites is that just because they are owned by the commons, do not have built improvements, doesn't mean they're not used to the appropriate public benefit. Thank you, Cora. Oh, for example, oh, and she points to portlandmaps.com, which, thank you, that's that's sort of the, the leading public resource to look at the city's zoning map. She said the, the majority of vacant sites in Lentz are for flood mitigation. It's true, it's very complex to evaluate sites, and that's why that it might be that some project of like systematically analyzing the entire city's map might be like overkill. Because it's like in reality, like one thing I would suggest. Uh, oh, Sharon also had the thought you could ask neighborhood associations. I would suggest an, uh, an activity which is like I think both constructive and sort of fun, which is challenge uh, ask anyone or maybe have a gathering and do this. Could be you know happy hour activity and say, all right, look at your neighborhood association area which is just kind of a convenient, there's like 95 community associations. That's kind of like the neighborhood where you are. You can actually go on Google, you can click on it. If you get the right link, you can pull up a Google map that has the outline of your neighborhood association. That's so like a square mile. And then say, all right, group or you, you need to find like the three best sites for an outdoor shelter, go. And it's fun. It's actually kind of really fun and illuminating because like you don't normally just systematically look on an aerial view and it really makes you think about would work. And, uh, and I think it, it, it surfaces a lot of useful things. Like one thing it surfaces is that different areas vary widely in how many sites they're likely to have available. When I did it in Multnomah Neighborhood Association, I found various areas. That I, I had no idea what they are. There's just this big forested area. It's like, Mark, I don't, it's just kind of behind these three houses. Here's an acre of land. Uh, and then I basically came up with a couple defunct parking lots and like church parking lots as the best choices. 
So that's another practical thing that I'd like to see happen and we can help uh, arrange, uh, help facilitate, hopefully. Let's, uh, Christy um, has a comment. Okay. Hi. Yeah, I'm Christy McMurtry, and I am a long-term member of St. Stephen's Episcopal Parish down on Southwest 13th and Clay downtown. Been around Portland since 1853. Um, we are the fiscal sponsor for Clay Street Table, uh, which is a huge outreach program, feeding program. We are surrounded by low-income housing. Uh, we uh, are affiliated with uh, great people that do work uh, uh, home PDX, and we also house Operation Nightwatch. Done that. They're a great organization. Has been here uh, 30 years in Portland, in the downtown area, and also outer southeast, uh, which is a really a hospitality program. Uh, what we found with all these partners is that, you know, we, we don't house anyone. Although we have housed people in our in our facility, and in fact have hired them. Um, so we do know what it means to develop trust and transition people. Maybe it's one by one, um, but I do remember going to several uh, forums on faith um, with the faith community, with the city, and I thought it was the giant office at one point when they were early on. And I sat around a table and they said, we have this great program. We can, you know, do you have the parking lots and, and you could take in one or two vehicles or, or whatever. And uh, at that point, you know, I said, well, we have nothing, we're on the street, but the, you know, there wasn't much, nobody, nobody latched onto that idea. It's like, oh, I, I looked around like somebody, you know, this is a perfect solution. Now, now that with this situation here, I feel like we are, we do have some space. Um, we will look for some funding to do something like convert one bathroom into a shower. But I'm, what I want to know is, is will the city or, you know, would they say, yes, we'll give you one vehicle spot on, on, you know, in front of your building. Um, or, uh, you know, how, how I love when somebody said, we need, yes, you know, we need people to say yes. Um, we have the support services, we have the connections. Um, we can support other people downtown potentially. We'd love to partner and talk um, talk to you all about what can we do if you have space and, and we have the connections. And um, one, one thing Operation Nightwatch has just started is a program to help um, tra trans women um, transition hopefully into housing. So. It is for some people, I think when somebody said there's a menu that's needed, it's true. Um, there's a whole different set of needs out there. Not everyone, it's not a one, one size fits all. We do need a menu of options. And for the people that are living with this experience, we do know that it, not everyone wants to be in a, a cool uh, uh, hazelnut Grove. Um, although again, I know those folks, they, they, they used to come to our building before COVID. And uh, long ago, we, we really understand the need for community. So we are, we, uh, most churches are communities. Uh, and so the idea of, of letting people into um, that community and, and sort of uh, being involved is I think a really healthy way to, to approach this. So I just wanted to throw that out there. I appreciate the, the people here and I'd love to follow up with a couple of people later. Thank you so much, uh, Christy. I think that's a perfect, I think that's actually a perfect segue to move us into wrapping up. Um, it highlights the point of, you know, there's a lot of folks with passion and energy who want to support the community. There isn't a single set of solutions um, that we need to pursue. We need to pursue a whole set continuum of options that range the gamut to meet people's needs. Because truly the populations of our community, including our houseless neighbors, have diverse needs. Um, I've spent a lot of time out in the community talking with folks, and it's very clear that, you know, some people would do extremely well in a self-governed, self-organized, self-managed camp, and other people need need more support. Um, and with that, um, I just wanted to thank every all of our panelists and all of the uh, all of you for joining us today. And I'm gonna pass it over to Tim, who's gonna wrap us up. Thanks, Sean. I wanna give a big thank you to these sponsors and donors that we have. And we do this, uh, this is specifically for this event. So it's kind of ad hoc. And we have uh, for a sponsor or patrons of this event were Keith Wilson of Titan Freight Systems in Portland, 
These are all on the event page and on the event, also on the event page. Keith Wilson, thank you. Thanks, Keith. I chatted with him on the back channel. Uh, Nate Ember of Ink Built Design in Portland. That's inkbuiltdesign.com. Human Solutions Portland, which is a major uh, shelter provider. And we had uh, Andy Miller was chatting and had some notes and questions. Thank you, Andy and Human Solutions. Uh, Portland Homeless Family Solutions, PHFS, which is at pdxhfs.org. Uh, Brandy Tuck was on the meeting earlier. Thank you, PHFS and Brandy. And St. Stephen's Episcopal Parish. I catch the name, but someone that was on just a minute ago uh, was, was from St. Stephen's. Um, and then sponsors, Stanley Penkin, David Dixon, Sue Gemmel, Samantha Petty, Sarah Carolus, Marissa Espinoza of Northwest Pilot Project, Mary Fellows, Hannah Studer, Margaret Zabrowski, who's a supporter of Hazelnut Grove, uh, Janet, Janet McManus, and Mimi German. Am I saying that right? German, Germain, uh, who is a amazing homeless advocate in the St. John's neighborhood and does fantastic work out there. Thank you so much to all of you. Uh, I should mention that we had this idea like before previous event and it was like an off the cuff idea that we totally thought maybe nobody would respond to. So it's been a really uh, inspiring surprise that with no, absolutely no need to do it, you're totally welcome to participate for free equally, but like a third of participants are donating in some way and that's wonderful. And also one thing it particularly allows us to do is to put a lot more effort into trying to reach out and, and get unhoused people on our calls and where we want to go with that. Okay, and so we're going to wrap up in a minute. And what we're going to do is turn off and end the recording, uh, which is the program, and I'll be on YouTube. But we're going to stay on the Zoom call for like half an hour, I think is how long it's for. So it's like, you know, after party, hangout, whatever. Um, any other closing thoughts, Sean? That's all. Thank you very much. And I'll end the recording.